All right, uh, we'll give everybody a few seconds to trickle in here and then we can then we can get started. All right, uh, welcome to the Corn Success Strategies webinar brought to you by Bayer and DeKalb Seeds. Uh, my name is Quinton Moorhead and I'm the National Account Manager of Top Crop Manager and the moderator of today's session. Uh, there are multiple factors to consider every year as the planting season quickly approaches, including how to set my corn up for success throughout the season. Today we'll learn more about using trade technology to help manage resistance in your corn with Dr. Jocelyn Smith, research scientist in field crop entomology and adjunct professor in the Department of Plant Agriculture at the University of Guelph, alongside Brock Smith and Mark Groen, technical solutions agronomist with Bayer Crop Science. We'll hear about what to look for when it comes to above and below ground insect protection in your corn and how you can manage pest pressure in your corn with the latest trait technologies. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. Uh, this session is scheduled to run for about 60 minutes. This group will speak for 45 of those minutes and following their presentation, we'll open the floor for questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the questions tab. Uh, it says Q&A at the bottom there on your computer screen. Uh, this webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU in crop management, and there will be further instructions for submission following the presentation. Uh, that's going to be it for me, so I'll let Jocelyn, Mark, and Brock take it away. Okay, thanks, Quentin, and good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm going to talk today about the current state of insect control using BT corn in Canada. You know, we've had this fantastic technology for about 25 years, and most corn growers have relied on it during that time and definitely benefited from it. However, the insects are ever evolving, and there have been some significant changes in pest susceptibility to BT corn in Canada in particular that are important for growers to be aware of. So that's what I'm gonna give you an update on today. And to uh, start off with, we'll do a quick review of kind of the history of BT corn. You know, this technology was first developed to target above ground pests of corn. And these are three of our main ones in Canada, uh, European corn borer on the left, Western bean cutworm in the middle and corn earworm on the right. And the story really starts with European corn borer. So, you know, we know about transgenic corn, what it is, right? We've, we've taken genes from this BT bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, and inserted them into corn plants so that the corn tissues produce these insecticidal proteins that are really specific to certain corn pests. If we look at the historical timeline, the first protein that came to the market was Pry1AB back in 1996 um, by, by a couple companies back then. In 2002, a second uh, protein came along from Dow AgriSciences, which was called Pry1F. And then uh, as we moved down the timeline, in 2008, we had Pry1A.105 and 2AB2, two, two, two proteins that are usually put together into the plant. Um, and then most recently, from Syngenta, we have the VIP3A protein. And so these are all from that BT bacteria. And originally, um, as I mentioned, the primary target pest was the European corn borer with these proteins. And the first three of those that came along in that timeline are highly, highly toxic to European corn borer. Um, it's interesting to note, though, that the VIP3A protein, uh, actually the corn borers have never been susceptible to that, that protein. So that's why it is always stacked with one of these others on the left. And so we've been monitoring for European corn borers to whether or not they were develop any tolerance to these proteins over time. That's part of the part of the registration um, criteria with, with any of these transgenic products that we, we monitor the pest for resistance. And with European corn borer, actually there's been no indication that they were developing resistance to any of these proteins uh, for about 25 years until unfortunately in 2018, we, we, we got a call to go out and uh, have a look at some cornfields in Nova Scotia around Truro. And in those fields, it was easy to find a lot of corn borer injury. In fact, uh, anywhere from 30 to 70% of the plants in those fields had corn borers in them, lots of feeding injury, like you can see in these pictures. Um, and these, we confirmed that these plants were producing that tri one f protein uh, that they're supposed to be susceptible to. So we collected a lot of those insects in Nova Scotia 
that fall brought them back to the lab here in Ridgetown, and we test them um, against uh, a, a concentration range of purified Cry1F proteins in the lab. And so you can see in this, this graph here, our response is uh, mortality in uh, to this different these different concentrations of Cry1F. And these two um, bars, or these two lines on the far left of the graph are two susceptible populations from southwestern Ontario, one near Niagara, one near London. And you can see we get mortality that happens very quickly with Cry1F. That's what we would normally expect to see. But these, these lines across the bottom of the screen are the collections we made from Nova Scotia and how they responded to the protein. And you can see that they it was a flat line. Essentially, they did not. And we, we, we can tell from this that these insects are highly resistant to Cry1F. And so this is unfortunately the very first detection in the world with European corn borer uh, that there's BC resistance evolving. And so since that detection, we have ramped up our resistance monitoring of corn borers across Canada, wherever we're growing corn, getting corn borers as, as uh, much as we can to test. And in addition to the um, detection there in Nova Scotia in 2018, unfortunately, we've been able to find another population uh, in Quebec in 2019 that had Cry1F resistance and another one out in Manitoba in 2020. Nothing in Ontario so far, but um, we're, we are seeing some things happening here across the country. So that, you know, there, there's our first detection of BC resistance at all, and it was Cry1F in particular with European corn borer in Canada, just to review that. Um, there's been, you know, there could be a number of reasons why this has happened. And uh, I won't go into all of those right now, except that one that we think may have a, a large part to play here is that in those small uh, short season markets, they didn't have a whole lot of options in terms of BC corn hybrids that we are used to, maybe some of the, the larger corn growing markets. And some of their, a lot of their hybrids were still just producing one BC protein, be it Cry1F in this case. Um, whereas throughout most, more, most of the other corn growing regions, you know, we've shifted to uh, planting corn hybrids that produce at least two, if not three different of these proteins targeting European corn borer. So there's been one trait there out on its own for a whole lot longer, getting a lot more exposure with corn borer populations. And so once the, the Cry1F resistance was detected, um, the industry responded by removing those single toxin hybrids by about 2020. Um, and unfortunately, what was the, the replacement in the pipeline, however, was in, in for uh, this particular market was a lot of Cry1F, Cry1AB hybrids. And so that's kind of concerning if we have Cry1F resistance because basically you're back to one, one protein with Cry1AB. Uh, so we, we've continued to monitor in that region. And uh, unfortunately in 2022, we were able to go into some of those fields that produce Cry1F, Cry1AB proteins and find corn borer feeding there. So this is our first detection of Cry1AB resistance as well. Uh, and with the similarity in these, in some of these proteins, you know, the, the more you see these names with numbers and letters, and the more similar they are, typically the, the more similar the proteins are. Therefore, it's a higher risk of cross resistance. And this Cry1AB resistance that we're finding is also associated with cross resistance to Cry1A.105. So now we have three of the of, of the major Cry proteins out there in jeopardy. And uh, just to make the story a little bit worse, in 2023, uh, for the very first time, we did see some significant injury in the field to Cry1A.105 and to ABC sweet corn in New Brunswick. And uh, as well, some of our colleagues in Connecticut saw this in a, in a sweet corn plot. So all of this is telling us that there are some shifts happening with European corn borer in North America, definitely in Canada. Now that uh, we found it in Canada, the U.S. is going to be looking a lot more closely in the next few years, and we are going to be keeping a careful eye on what's happening with the future of this, this test and its resistance to beet corn. So let's move along to western bean cutworm, another uh, above-ground corn pest that's a voracious ear feeder. A lot of us in Ontario are quite familiar with it, but it's really gotten worse in Quebec and into the maritime provinces in the last uh, few years as well. So if we look at those, those above ground VC proteins, once again, um, the uh, Cry1AB protein has actually never worked against Western bean cutworm. They're just not susceptible to that protein. 
Um, we thought there was some susceptibility to cry one f as uh, as western bean cutworm moved into the corn belt in the last 20 years or so. And they were also not susceptible to 1A.105 or 2A B3 protein. They are highly susceptible, however, to the VIP3 pro VIP 3A protein. But just to talk a little bit about what happened with Cry1F, we, as I said, we thought there was some control with that protein. And uh, you can see this is uh, some data from uh, southwestern Ontario near Bothwell back in 2011. If you just look at this green box on my chart here, we had some side-by-side -side trials of non-BT and smart stacks hybrids out in the field there. And smart stacks expresses the Cry1F, the Cry1AB, or sorry, Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB2 protein. So of those three, we know Cry1F is the only one providing any protection. And uh, originally, um, where we had maybe 90% of the non-BT corn ears with injury from Western bean cutworm, you would see about 55% of the Cry1F hybrids with that type of in, with that injury. So it wasn't perfect by any means. There wasn't a lot of control there, but there was something. However, if you look into the subsequent years, uh, 2012 to 2014, you can see in those side-by-side -side plots that there was no difference between the smart stacks and the non-BT hybrids in controlling Western bean cutworm. So we quickly saw its tolerance to, to the Cry1F protein increase in a short time. And then our neighboring uh, uh, producers in the state saw the same thing. Michigan, uh, Indiana, Ohio, everybody was kind of experiencing this at the same time. So we confirmed that we have resistance to Cry1F with Western bean cutworm. So really we only have the VIP3A protein left that is effective against uh, this insect. And there are more hybrids uh, coming to the market all the time that produce that protein. And lastly, for above ground pests, let's look at corn earworm. Now, this isn't one that we consider a major um, field corn pest, but it does seem to show up uh, in some years a lot lately. And the, the background with this one and these CT proteins was that uh, Cry1AB originally had good control of uh, corn earworm. Cry1F never had any control on this insect. 1A.105 and 2AB2 was good, and VIP has been very good. However, I'm going to tell, show you the shift with this one over time as well with some of those traits. Um, so these box plots are from a lot of um, sweet corn plots in the U.S. where they monitored injury by uh, corn earworm to ears of sweet corn. These little dots um, where they land on these bar on these graphs uh, show you the amount of injury. So the lower they are on on the vertical axis, the better. So from 1996 to 2003, in this first plot or this first box, you could see that there was a really good control of corn earworm that came out with, as Cry1AB was first being deployed. But over time, you can see with these different uh, time periods, those boxes have slowly shifted up. And we know that cry, uh, corn earworm has developed resistance to Cry1AB over time. And we can see the same thing has happened with Cry1A.105 and 2AB2 from those plots. So this is in the US, but uh, we we get the same results here in Canada because corn earworm, unlike European corn borer and Western bean cutworm, corn earworm does not overwinter in Canada. All the populations of earworm that we receive fly in from the U.S., so all their resistance genes fly with them. So that's why we're seeing the same amount, the same lack of control with all of these BT hybrids now. Really, again, just like Western bean cutworm, the VIP3A protein is the only one that will control corn earworm. Okay, and let's move on to our last major corn insect pest in Canada, corn rootworm. And this is really the only below ground pest that we target with BT corn. Uh, so similar story. Originally, there were um, three different BT proteins for corn rootworm. Cry 3BB1 from Monsanto, now Bayer. Cry 3435 from Dow AgriSciences, now Corteva. And M Cry 3A from Syngenta. And over time, um, they the companies wanted to pyramid these proteins into the same plant to, again, reduce the risk of, of rootworms becoming resistant to them over time. And so where we have pyramids of Cry3BB1 and 3435, that's what you usually find in, in the smart stack products to date. Um, Cry3435 being pyramided with M cry 3 a are the proteins that you find in Optimum Agrimax and Chrome products. And then lastly, 
um, MCRI-3A and uh, Syngenta came out with one other new protein called ECRI 3.1 AB. Those are what are pyramided in the sericate hybrids. So now what's the case, what is the uh, story on resistance though with, with on rootworm? Although these, uh, these traits and BT, BT control for rootworm was a game changer, unfortunately resistance has happened a lot more quickly with rootworm than it has with uh, some of our above ground tests. So as uh, cry 3 bb one was first planted in 2003 in North America, by, by 2009, they were starting to see resistance develop with that pest in Iowa. Um, and then Nebraska, Illinois, Minnesota, a few years after that, and it's become pretty widespread in Iowa by 2014. Cry 3 bb one was the first one to go. Uh, Cry 3435 uh, resistance was first detected in some of those uh, Midwest or Corn Belt states in around 2013. And one other little factor here is some of these Cry 3 proteins have a lot in common. And so where you have uh, resistance developed to Cry 3 bb one it confers cross resistance to M Cry 3A uh, and often the E Cry 3.1 AB protein as well from Syngenta. So this, uh, unfortunately, we saw resistance to all of these rootworm proteins within about eight years of commercialization. And the story in Ontario is actually pretty similar. So on this map, we we these orange um, spots show you fields that have had um, quite a history of continuous corn. And going back to even 2012 was the first time we were investigating uh, fields where the rootworm uh, hybrids were not performing like we expected them to. And so you can see there's been a few cases here and there every year. And in the last two or three years, the number of cases has really been ramping up. And um, I'm sure there are a lot more dots than just what's here on the map now. And especially if you're in an area with a lot of livestock production, you're probably aware of some rootworm control issues happening in those uh, areas. So where do we go from here, where we seem to be losing rootworm control more than anything? Um, well, we do have a new transgenic event for rootworm that's coming this year in 2024. Uh, it's not a BT protein, but it's the RNAi trait. And uh, the RNAi works a little bit differently in that it's basically just rather than binding to the mid-gut of the, of the rootworms like the, the BTs do and causing their, their uh, some compromised uh, gut linings and killing them that way. This interferes with their actual um, DNA and protein production, and, and it's going to disrupt some critical protein production that they need to survive. So it will slowly kill them. Um, and it's a, it's a new mode of action, which is great. It's going to be pyramided with Cry 3 bb one and 3435 in these new products from Bayer, which are the SmartStax Pro technology you're going to hear about more today. And then the very same um, uh, products are going to be in the boar seed um, corn hybrids from Pioneer. So it's great that there's something new on the market for rootworm management, but there's definitely a risk that resistance will develop quickly to it as well if growers don't use it carefully. So I really would like to have growers consider this graphic for preserving the RNAi event and whatever rootworm control we still have with the other uh, BT proteins, the rootworm. So if you look at the, on the left here where it says first year corn, low to no corn rootworm risk. So in Ontario, you can keep in mind that we don't have the rotation resistant corn rootworm that exists in some states. So therefore there should be no, whoops, no need to control rootworm in first year corn. If you're going to be planting second or third year corn, um, you know, you can determine what your rootworm risk is like by scouting the, the crop in the previous year. And if you see on average, more than one rootworm beetle per plant, then there's a good chance that in the subsequent year, you're going to have rootworm uh, populations that could be economically injurious. So you would need to control root, rootworm using a transgenic hybrid, or maybe soil insecticide if that's an option for you. But we're really recommending that you please don't grow continuous corn, especially the uh, transgenic corn for rootworm for more than three consecutive years. Um, we know that with the uh, BT proteins in the early days, if, if rootworms were exposed to them for three consecutive generations or three years in the field, they would develop resistance. And the same thing will happen with the RNAi. So that's why our three-year 
number is pretty important. Um, and again, always crop rotation is the best way to control corn rootworm. If there isn't corn in the field that they're, all those eggs are laid in when they hatch out to feed in the spring, they're all gonna die. And there, there's really no other crop that we grow in Ontario that would support their populations other than corn. So the best way to, to control them is to rotate. So I want to encourage growers to, who are growing corn to think longer term for corn pest management. Um, all of these pests that I talked about today, they, you know, we don't just want to rely on transgenic corn for managing them in the long run. We're starting to see a lot of cracks in the system now with insect resistance, and it takes years and years and hundreds of millions of dollars for these new products to come to the market. So they're, they won't be coming fast and furious by any means. It'll be slow. <laughs> so we still need to think about outsmarting the pests. And when we get, you know, complacent and use the same thing over and over again, the pest will eventually adapt. Um, I would especially encourage us not to overuse transgenic corn for corn rootworm. Talked about rotation as your best bet. And there are reasons why we're concerned about Western mean cutworm uh, developing resistance to the VIP trait as well, if we overuse that. So in a way, it's maybe a good thing that the VIP hybrids have been slow to come to the market. and. In, in some years, you can get away with uh, not needing to control for Western bean cutworm or, you know, spraying an insecticide if, if, if you reach a threshold. So that's uh, another way to avoid resistance by not using the same strategy for that pest all the time. And finally, we'd like you to keep an eye out on the performance of your transgenic corn in terms of pest control. If you see what we would call unexpected injury to your transgenic corn, then let your seed dealer, your agronomist, uh, the OMACRA staff, or even myself know because we want to uh, know where this is starting to show up. And so lastly, I'd just like to remind everyone that they can find essentially all of this information that I talked about on the Canadian Corn Pest Coalition website, cornpest.ca. And there will be just any moment now, a brand new uh, table going up of all of the current BT corn products available for Canada. And it breaks it down by which of those proteins are available for each pest, which I tried to do in this discussion. And there's also a table there that talks about the resistance status of, uh, of all of the pests in Canada and in the US, what we know is uh, starting to show up in the field. So I'll leave it like th uh, there and take some questions, I guess, at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. Always nice to hear about the realities of these insect traits and stuff going forward. Um, so my name's Brock Smith um, and Mark Grone here as well. We'll be covering a traits update with Bear. Um, so I'm a TSA Technical Solutions Agronomist based out of Chatham, Ontario. And I'm based out of Renfrew, which is just a little bit Northwest of Ottawa Been working in Eastern Ontario for a number of years now, and I'll also be making some visits to central Ontario uh, this coming year as part of my new role. And uh, yeah, so Dr. Smith covered, did an excellent job of covering off uh, some of the resistant issues and the traits that are available in the marketplace. What Brock and I are going to do over the next few minutes is dig into corn traits a little bit further, particularly Bayer's corn traits, and just see where Bayer's headed over the next couple of years and some of the tools that we're going to have uh, available. So the first question that comes to mind, and I think Dr. Smith already did an excellent job of covering some of this off, but why are corn traits uh, so important? So traded corn is, is the corn we grow, uh, essentially. You know, Roundup Ready corn is an example. It made for a very simple herbicide program for a number of years. And then we ran into uh, a little bit of resistance. So Roundup or glyphosate still very, very important, but resistance, uh, you know, became a concern. And what we're going to be focusing on today is BT corn for insect protection. We've had a bit of a theme already in the same, and that is, is resistance. So what is BT corn? Basically, it's biotechnology that allows the corn plant to produce proteins that they wouldn't normally produce. And that protein is what kills the target insect. So if you look at the list on the slide uh, in front of you, you can see that we're able to control a number of different pests that historically have been an issue. You know, something like European corn borer, 
not something I've ever experienced myself, but I have heard some stories about it, some fields going down, some pretty extreme yield loss, and, you know, BT traits have, have resolved that. So traits are important for controlling some of the biggest insect problems in corn, like I mentioned, corn borer, another huge one for us is corn rootworm. And for a lot of people listening, you might think they haven't been a problem for years for me, or if you're in the early part of your farming career, you might say they've never been a problem, and maybe they haven't. And you may not be focusing on treating them, but in many cases, we are treating for them with corn traits on the market today, whether they those traits come from Bayer or, or from another company. So first trait that we're gonna be digging into a little bit is Double Pro. It's built on Roundup Ready technology, meaning you can spray Roundup glyphosate on, on this crop. It has two BT proteins for modes of action for above ground stock and ear insect protection only. And this is the trait that we would choose primarily where Eastern corn borer is the most concern. It does also cover off Southwestern corn borer, not really a problem in Ontario because of its limited range, because uh, it can't survive with lower temperatures. So essentially with double pro, if you're planting the seed, you don't need to spray any kind of foliar insecticide to control corn borers. You might not feel like you're doing much, but you've been doing the best control method that we've ever had, and that's BT traits. And if you're in a situation where you're filling contracts for non-GMO, like some folks are here in Eastern Ontario for Ingredion, uh, you may find that corn borer pressure does exist. Uh, you can talk to some of the growers out in, in this part of the world. And I'm not saying don't grow non-GMO. The Calb offers some non-GMO hybrids, but I think it's important to be aware that these pests are alive and, and well. And I've heard it said before, said before, I never had an issue. And I think a big part of that has to do with having the BT traits in the market for so long. Uh, a lot of these pest populations are, are reduced, I would say. The next thing that we're looking at is Double Pro plus Viv3A. So Viv3A, that's licensed from Syngenta. And as Dr. Smith said earlier, that's the only uh, effective protein for controlling Western bean cutworm. Anyway, double pro plus VIV3A, that equals Tricepta for us. What Tricepta is, is, is once again, it's built on that Roundup Ready technology. So we can spray Roundup on this crop. It has above ground stock and ear insect protection with the addition of black cutworm and very importantly, Western bean cutworm. And it's the most above ground uh, Okay, Tricepta, it offers the, the best uh, above ground insect protection. Um, again, covering Western bean cutworm uh, with black cutworm uh, on top of the double pro trait, which it builds on top of there. So uh, next here, uh, we have Smart Stacks. Um, so Smart Stacks uh, has above ground and below ground protection. Um, Above ground and below ground protection. So it has two modes of action, BT modes of action against corn rootworm. Um, and then covers, has two modes of action against corn earworm, three for fall armyworm, uh, three for European corn borer, and also covers one mode of action against black cutworm. So those are all BT traits, uh, as Dr. Smith was referring to. Uh, so BT traits for modes of protection there. Um, and then offering above ground and below ground with smart stacks. And with smart stacks, um, you are getting uh, Roundup tolerance. So you can spray Roundup over top of it as well as Liberty. So you can spray Roundup or Liberty over top of smart stacks products uh, for your weed control options as well. So, how do we make smart stacks better? Um, so, this is a new commercial trait available this year. Uh, builds off of smart stacks and adds this RNAi technology uh, to help with below ground uh, rootworm protection. So the RNAi technology is a new novel mode of action against corn rootworm, and this is the product we're calling Smart Stacks Pro. A little video here to help explain Smart Stacks Pro. For years, farmers have worked hard with the help of BT Trades to defend this from corn rootworm. Now, they have an additional ally in their fight, RNAi technology, and it's found right here. 
SmartStacks Pro with RNAi technology provides farmers a proven BT-based defense, plus an entirely new mode of action to defend roots on even the toughest acres. Let's dig deeper. Ribonucleic acid interference, or RNAi, is the key to this new defense, and it happens at the molecular level. Like BT traits, the RNAi base trait is built into the corn plant, waiting for corn rootworm to feed on it. Once they do, the technology goes to work. Corn rootworms produce an essential protein vital to their life cycle. RNAi, true to its name, interferes with that naturally occurring process. By stopping the production of the essential protein specific to corn rootworm, it effectively causes mortality after ingestion. SmartStacks Pro with RNAi technology. The future of defense is here. Defend like a pro. So a nice little video anyways, helps explain it uh, a little more smoothly than sometimes when I try anyways. Um, so again, uh, SmartSax Pro are with RNAi technology um, acts at the cellular level. Um, so it interferes, uh, so mRNAi interferes with the mRNA, uh, so proteins aren't produced and that's what kills the corn rootworm. Um, again, this is a bite to kill trait. So the root or the corn rootworms must actually ingest uh, the root tissue uh, in order for the trait to have its effect. So it's similar in that manner to the BT traits, uh, but is a novel mode of action in how it actually kills the corn rootworm. So SmartStacks Pro, um, so it um, added additional mode of action. So it has RNAi technology plus the two BT traits for corn rootworm. So three modes of action against corn rootworm. And then added to it is the everything else that comes with the smart stacks as well. So two modes of action against earworm, three against fall armyworm, and three modes of action against corn borer as well as black cutworm. Um, with this, again, similar to smart stacks, you can apply both the Roundup and Liberty over top of the crop uh, for your weed control. So it's continual improvement on trait packaging offering by Bayer. We're excited to be launching. Uh, in 2025, uh, VT4 Pro. So VT4 Pro is a combination of our most robust above-ground insect protection, Tricepta. Uh, added to this, this RNAi technology, as well as a BT trait, uh, the Cry3 BB1 uh, BT protein for below-ground protection. So this is going to provide two modes of action for below-ground protection against corn rootworm, uh, as well as the added Tricepta trait for above-ground uh, insect protection. Um, so keep your eye out in the decal plots this summer uh, for VT4 products in there. So here, uh, another snapshot of it. Again, two uh, rootworm effective modes of action. So the BT trait plus the RNAi technology, uh, as well as the Western bean cutworm uh, with the VIP3 trait in there. Um, for herbicide tolerance, uh, remember that this is only Roundup tolerant. Um, so do not spray Liberty over top of VT4 Pro. So we had trials uh, with these with these traits this past summer. Um, in order to, I guess, show the slides and stuff and later on here and show what the numbers mean, you kind of got to dig into visual injury. So visual injury uh, is based off of uh, root node injury scores. So zero being um, no feeding and three being absolutely destroyed. Um, so that's kind of the scale we go off of. You can kind of look, think of that now as we look into the slides in a second here. Um, for rough, rough estimation, uh, it's about 15% yield reduction per node um, that's chewed on the corn plant there. So 15% for one node chewed, uh, so that would be a 1.0. A 2.0 would be a, roughly a correlate to about a 30% yield reduction. And a 3.0 would be about a 45% yield reduction. Um, just just a, a rough idea there anyways for yield losses um, with corn rootworm feeding. Um, so these, this is trial and data collected in 2023 uh, across grower field scale trials with the Calb agronomist this past summer. Uh, thanks again to the great cooperators for working with us and conducting these trials. 
Um, so this is 16 sites across uh, both Ontario and Quebec um, with known medium to high corn rootworm pressure. Um, we did target a medium to high rootworm pressure sites. Um, so we could kind of pressure test these traits to see differences in performance. Uh, and possibly there's a couple sites there that could be developing some resistance to the BT traits as well. Um, so keep this in mind, it wouldn't necessarily uh, be equivalent to the average corn rootworm population seed in the countryside across uh, Ontario and Quebec, but it does let us compare trait efficacy uh, quite nicely here. So here on the left, uh, you see VT Double Pro. Um, this does not have any below ground protection. Um, so you're seeing a high number there uh, on the zero to one or zero to three ratings. So it does show us that there's significant feeding um, from corn rootworm at these sites. And then all the other traits there are do, do provide below ground uh, corn rootworm protection. So it is showing that um, there is a reduction in the feeding. So it's showing these traits are having effect. Um, SmartStacks Pro on the right, uh, lowest uh, feeding on the roots there. Uh, so showing very strong eff efficacy against uh, corn rootworm at these medium to high pressure sites. Um, smart stacks in the middle is continuing to be a viable option for below ground uh, rootworm protection. Uh, VT4 Pro just to the right of it there uh, pro performed well against smart stacks and competitive trait offerings, uh, and also offering a better overall insect protection with a better above ground insect protection in the VT4 Pro. So we we'll, we'll see VT4 Pro fitting nicely uh, where smart stacks products uh, have currently been grown. And the SmartStacks Pro having a nice fit on a hot a medium to higher corn rootworm pressure situations. So here are some images from these trials to, to kind of back up the data from the previous slides. Uh, the double double pro, the VT double pro on the left again, no insect below ground insect protection there against corn rootworm. So lots of root feeding and pruning going on there. Um, so and then on the right there. Uh, we got SmartStacks Pro, uh, nice healthy fibrous roots. Again, there would be some feeding on this as larvae need to actually chew on the roots and ingest some of the plant tissue in order for the, the toxins to have their effect. Uh, SmartStacks Pro uh, has, has a little bit more feeding in there. Uh, could be could be a case where some BT resistance is, is coming through there at these higher pressure locations as well. Um, this, so this RNA technology looked great in plots here, uh, but again, it's always good to remember that it's not a silver bullet for corn rootworm control. Uh, it should be treated as another tool to be used against corn rootworm, but it doesn't replace tro proper trait stewardship and the need to rotate to a non-host crop. Um, relying on RNAi solely, especially where BT resistance is starting to build up, uh, puts all the pressure on this RNA trait. Uh, which could quickly lead to the development of resistant populations against this RNAi mode of action. Um, so here we got uh, corn rootworm risk is how we see it, kind of no risk uh, on the left, uh, all the way to high risk on the right. So kind of a no risk to low risk would be first year corn at kind of in a multi-crop rotation. Uh, low risk would be first year kind of returning to corn uh, for corn root or for corn rootworm, um, some sandy ground, or maybe there's no corn rootworm concerns kind of in your area. Um, in the middle, so mid risk, kind of that yellow zone there would be um, if you're going more uh, two years corn on corn kind of thing, or two years returning to the corn. Um, some sandy or loamy or heavier ground can increase your risk as well, or maybe you have some corn rootworm concerns in your area. And then a higher risk would be uh, that three years of corn, loam or heavier ground, uh, you have high concerns about rootworm in your fields, or possibly you saw some bit, uh, visible injury uh, the previous year. So scouting is always important in determining the following year, year's level of feeding risk. Uh, so scout for adults in August for corn rootworm beetles. Um, high numbers doesn't always indicate that you're gonna have a, a insect, high insect uh, pressure the following year. Uh, but it is a good prediction on what you could expect for rootworm uh, larva the following year. If you're seeing high levels of adults one year, the next year, you could, could definitely have a high level of feeding from the larva the following year. So how, how our traits kind of fit in here, we have uh, double pro and tricepta. So these are non-traded for corn rootworm. 
So there's no corn rootworm traits in double pro intercepta. So if you're on nice rotated ground, there's no need for these low ground traits. Uh, this is where double pro intercepta fit nicely. Um, so the difference between here, where if you have Western bean cutworm pressure, that that'll decide your can help make the decision from double pro to tricepta, as tricepta is offering uh, the VIP trait, which does control Western bean cutworm, um, if you're not wanting to spray anyways. Um, so, and then if there's pressure from corn rootworm, that kind of guides you from these two above ground trade offerings towards SmartStacks VT4 Pro and SmartStacks Pro. Um, BT4 Pro and SmartStacks Pro are best positioned on low to mid corn rootworm risk areas. Um, and then if you're worried about Western bean cutworm, um, that's where VT4 fits nicely because it's bringing that VIT trait as well. Whereas smart stacks, if you're if you have a Western bean cutworm and you'd possibly need to spray um, in a smart stack scenario, but the V the VIP trait is in VT4 Pro um, for Western bean cutworm. Um, and then smart stacks pro offering the premium corn rootworm protection for mid to high uh, rootworm risk areas. And always remember it's best management practice to rotate out of corn into a non-host uh, crop. Uh, reset the clock and have a clean slate for a rootworm uh, in the fields. Okay, thanks, Brock. Uh, so just kind of in summary, we went through a number of traits uh, there, and uh, I think it can all get pretty pretty confusing. But I think the key thing is is the double pro. That's for above ground protection where western bean cutworm is not an issue. Then Tricepta provides the best above ground protection and that includes Western bean cutworm. Then we have our Smart Stacks product that provides above as well as below ground protection. The one above ground pest it is missing is Western bean cutworm. And that's where VT4 Pro is quite exci exciting because it's gonna be the most kind of complete insect protection for above and below ground pest. And that's gonna be coming in 2025 as mentioned earlier. Then we have Smart Stacks Pro and that's offering that premium corn rootworm protection for those mid to high rest risk uh, acres. So my suggestion would be is if you're ever in doubt, uh, you know, you can talk to your Bayer rep, you can talk to whoever you're buying seed uh, from, and you can ask the questions, you know, what pests am I, am I getting protection from? So if you're looking for above ground protection, make sure, and like it's for Western bean cutworm, make sure that you're getting Tricepta because that's the product that's going to protect you against that pest, just as just as an example, uh, you're paying for the traits. Make sure that they're they're doing what they need to do uh, for your farm. So hopefully that visual is helpful. Next, what I wanted to just jump through is some of the different offerings that we have within Bayer within DeKalb as far as our Tricepta and Smart Stacks Pro offerings. Uh, and what's exciting, I think, about these products is we have good pest protection without compromising yield. Not only do we have improved uh, trade packages, there's some great genetics that go along with those products. And as you can see, uh, they're bringing a yield advantage versus the competition. And in addition to that, they tend to bring a yield advantage on average versus other DeKalb uh, hybrids. So it's kind of a win-win as far as genetics and trade performance. What I wanted to dig into just a little bit more is our Smart Stacks uh, Pro hybrids. The reason I want to do that is these are brand new hybrids. They aren't on the website yet or in the seed guide, but they actually are for sale. So if you are interested in any of these hybrids and you feel as if they might be a good fit for, for your farm, you can contact your seed supplier and uh, find the one that's most uh, appropriate for you. And, and with that, I just want to say thanks for attending our session here today. And as mentioned earlier, there are CCA credits, and I think we'll get to some of the questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Justin, Mark, and Brock. That's going to do it for the formal presentation part of this webinar, so we can open up for some Q&A here. We've got a couple that came through here, so I can dive into those. And just a reminder that this has been approved for one CEU credit, so take out your phone, open up the CCA app, scan the QR code to redeem these credits. Um, if you have any trouble with that, please email your first name, last name, and CCA number to topcrop at annexbusinessmedia.com, and we will submit that for you.
Uh, first one is for Dr. Smith. You showed a map with corn intensity and BT resistant rootworm populations. Um, what are the growers doing differently in high corn intensity areas northeast of Chatham to prevent resistance buildup? So I'm, maybe I'm not following the question. What are the, what are they? Are we talking about why are the resistance issues happening where they are? Or why are we not seeing resistance happen in certain areas? <laughs> yeah, what are growers doing differently Where in high are, city areas? They're just growing a lot of corn on corn <laughs> and using, using <laughs> they've been using and relying on the traits, you know, for a lot of years. Um, and as the, yeah, as the tolerance is starting to build with these rootworm populations, so the rootworm populations are building as well. Right. And and you have more resistance genes in the population. And so not only is it just a numbers game, but also the beetles don't just stay in one field, right? They are going to move, uh, especially later in the season. They look for later planted corn fields to go to and find some fresher, better, better corn to feed on. So the beetles, this is, right? So they will move around. So this is something that is gonna start to spread and has been spreading. Yeah. Right. I hope that answers um, the question. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, another corn on corn question. So a few slides back, you had a corn trade efficiency slide. Uh, what year corn were these fields? Well, I think that's for Mark and Brock. Yeah, Mark and, Mark and Brock, I think. Sorry, you repeat that? Uh, your corn trade efficiency slide, what year corn were these? So year one corn, year two corn, year three corn. Do you know, or if not, um, maybe get back in to our, it. In our 16 trials, yeah, we, we weren't, there were definitely corn on corn. We weren't really targeting, they had to be so many years corn on corn kind of thing. Um, just making sure we were placing it on corn on corn where we knew we, we were going to have pressure. Gotcha. So it would, it would be kind of, could be everything kind of thing from first year, at first year corn on corn to five plus year corn on corn. Gotcha. Uh, another one, does VIP protection also translate into lower VOM? Sure, I can answer that one too. Um, they're asking, does the VIP3A um, protein, if it's protecting against Western mean cutworm, are we going to have lower VOM or DAWN, the mycotoxin that uh, that is a real problem for livestock? And the answer is probably yes. Um, when we've shown in some of our research from uh, the campus here that Western mean cutworm injury on, on corn can definitely increase the amount of mycotoxins in the grain. And it really doesn't even matter how much feeding there is by Western bean cutworm. It's just the fact that there is any there. The Western bean cutworm make a new entry point where some of these fungal spores from Fusarium get in there and infect more of the ear. So yes, we definitely see uh, lower mycotoxin levels where we control Western bean cutworm. So the VIP hybrid should definitely play a role in that. But you know that's not the, the total story. There is still some factor there to do with the susceptibility of the hybrid to fusarium infection as well. So some some hybrids are going to be a little more sensitive to it than others, but hopefully you have some good tolerance in what we're selecting with these new VIP hybrids, and, and that should help the whole system. Perfect. Um, not a long one. I'm a grower with a corn, soybean, wheat rotation and do not grow corn on corn. There are a few hybrids with below ground insect protection that I'm interested in growing this year. Are there any issues with growing these hybrids, even though I'm not worried about corn rootworm? Do you want me to answer this one too? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, take that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand that, that that happens. And as I said, we we don't currently think we have this rotation resistant corn rootworm in Ontario. So in in theory, there should not be any rootworms surviving in a first year corn field. However, you know, we're, we're something we need to keep an eye on. It it uh, it is in some of our neighboring states, and we've maybe heard rumors here and there. We've just never been able to really nail it down that it's spread over here. But anyway, there you know, the bottom line is as a as a as an IPM person, you would say they'd rather you didn't do that just in case. Um, but chances are it's probably not an issue at this time. Perfect. I guess then from a bear point following up on that, 
um, we kind of go off off of we'd say it's okay kind of thing based off of your rotating well your rotation and then kind of there's other things that go with it too right yield performance um different agronomic traits um and how they perform they're kind of like insurance kind of thing it's insurance even though you don't need it it's insurance if there are are some larvae in the field um and then you got to know there there could be a price uh a little bit price increase to pay for that trade too. So there's other a lot of things that come into play uh, with that as well. Awesome. We got two smart stacks pro questions. So I would assume that'll be for the Bayer guys, and then um, that's it. So if anybody else has any other questions, uh, feel free to type them into that Q and A tab. Um, else we got two more. Um, how much of the smart stacks pro plant does the corn root worm need to eat before the insect is infected by it? I think you answered that a couple of times, but it's just a uh, nice to nice point to send home. Sure. So I, and these are all bite to kill traits. So I'd say that there's always a little bit of feeding that's going to be uh, expected, but the amount actually ingested is actually going to be pretty minimal. And I think uh, Brock put up some nice slides there from Stefan Mir, and that was on a, at a site with some pretty good corn rootworm pressure. And we saw that that double pro uh, hybrid that doesn't have any corn rootworm protection was eaten quite badly where the smart stacks had some very minimal, minimal feeding. So typically uh, not a lot, but it is bite to kill. Gotcha. Um, and then should smart stacks pro be used proactively to defend against corn rootworm if the corn rootworm pressure I'm currently seeing is small? I guess uh, I can answer that. Um, a lot of that would depend on the, your risk scenario that you're in, right? Um, is it corn and corn? Has it been that for a while? Um, is there resistance pressure and stuff uh, around you? Um, that, that's a worry as well. So it's all kind of scenario specific driven on that front, I would say. Awesome. Well, it, it looks like that's it for questions for right now. So again, they put their uh, contact information on the screen there. Uh, just another reminder, if anybody did have trouble scanning the QR code for the CCA credits, uh, send your first name, last name, and CCA number to topcrop at annexbusinessmedia.com, and we'll, uh, we'll submit that for you. So uh, with no more questions, thank you all for joining us today for the second and final part of the Soybean and Corn Success Strategies series brought to you by Bayer and DeKalb Seeds. Uh, we're wishing you all a safe and successful season and um, it's just right around the corner. So thanks to all of you and uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.